Opinions on electric vehicles have changed a lot over the past few years, but there is still a lot of FUD. Fear, uncertainty and doubt floating around. One of the most prominent bits of misinformation is the claim that once carbon dioxide emissions from battery sourcing and construction are taken into account, electric vehicles are just as polluting as petrol and diesel ones. This is false, and we've known it to be false for some time. But for those who still hold these beliefs, well, perhaps this latest report by Transport and Environment will change their minds. The new study, titled From Dirty Oil to Clean Batteries, published a few weeks ago, takes an in-depth look at the overall environmental impact, including sourcing and manufacturing of battery electric vehicles, or BEVs, when compared to their gasoline counterparts in Europe. We've covered T&E before on this channel, but as a brief reminder, it is a federation of non-governmental organisations in the European Union that focuses on research and policy around sustainability. Obviously, that does lead to potential bias, so we should keep that in mind as we talk about this report. The paper covers several major topics. The European battery industry's ability to keep up with projected demand, the projected supply and sourcing of raw materials, the lifetime environmental impact comparison of BEVs versus fossil fuel vehicles, and Europe's current and forecasted dependency on fossil fuels and battery materials. I'm going to cover each of these, giving you some context and letting you know which conclusions might not be quite so straightforward. Right now, we are living in something of a lithium-ion revolution. Lithium-ion batteries have been in use for years in everything from cell phones to toothbrushes, but the fast growth of the EV and energy storage industry has caused demand for new batteries to skyrocket. Today, demand in Europe completely outstrips supply, but this year Europe could reach 90 gigawatt hours per year of production capacity. That's roughly in line with the forecasted demand. In the following five years, a new wave of European gigafactories will allow supply to increasingly exceed demand. This could technically allow Europe to become an exporter of EV battery packs. By 2025, the supply of cells is predicted to reach 425 gigawatt hours Europe-wide, far exceeding the 300 gigawatt hours of predicted demand in the continent. But around 2030, with a supply predicted to be 730 gigawatt hours, the demand for battery packs is expected to catch up with supply. When we talk about future gigafactories in Europe, I suspect most will probably think about the Tesla Giga Berlin project. But Tesla is far from the only company that is expanding its battery production in the EU. LG Energy, Cattle, Northvolt and many, many other companies, including Volkswagen as we learned this week, have plans for new gigafactories in the continent. In the next 10 years, there's more than 22 planned gigafactories that will be constructed. This report also examines the way in which technological improvements will increase the efficiency of the cell chemistry, reducing demand for raw materials. One measure of the efficiency of cell production's use of raw materials is to look at the mass of different metals that are actually required per kilowatt hour of battery cell capacity. Current batteries require around one tenth of a kilogram of lithium per kilowatt hour of storage, but T&E believes that this could be reduced to 0 0.05 kilograms per kilowatt hour by 2030. The paper also finds that an even greater reduction in cobalt could be possible over the same period of time. Cobalt requirements could drop from the current level of 0.13 kilograms per kilowatt hour all the way down to just 0 0.03 kilograms per kilowatt hour. This theoretical reduction in metal usage should allow manufacturers to make more batteries from the same amount of physical raw material. Despite these improvements in manufacturing efficiency, Demand for raw materials will continue to go up because growth in battery demand will far outpace the gains from cell chemistry improvements. Between 2020 and 2030, the report finds that the demand for lithium will also increase from 5 to 36 kilotons, the cobalt will increase from 7 to 21 kilotons, and nickel from 26 to 276 kilotons. The increase in demand has been met by increased supply, and these materials must be sourced from somewhere first. Instead of focusing on where the materials will be sourced from geographically, the paper focuses on the need to obtain raw materials in part from battery recycling efforts. 
Unlike internal combustion engine cars whose fuel cannot be reused, raw materials inside a battery pack may be reclaimed and recycled at the end of the battery's usable lifespan. The big picture consequence of this is that each time an EV has its pack recycled, there's one less battery's worth of raw materials that need to be mined. Currently, very few batteries are recycled, but this is changing. Both the European Commission and T&E have released different recycling targets, with T&Es being much more aggressive. If the targets laid out by the European Commission are followed, the amount of wasted lithium, cobalt and nickel could drop by 92%. The decrease will be 97% with the T&E guidelines. And with the T&E guidelines in place, by 2035, there could be a reduction in primary material demand of 28% for lithium, 22% for cobalt, and 67% for nickel. At the moment, Europe only has a few companies working on battery recycling. Umicore, Veloia, Northvolt, and Volkswagen come to mind. Capacity is very limited, and it will need to expand dramatically to meet this vastly larger need. Just for comparison, in 2020, China had the capacity to recycle 23 times more batteries than Europe did. While Europe currently imports the vast majority of the metals needed to create battery packs, it actually has reserves of all three. Without recycling, the EU has enough reserves to manufacture 11 million electric vehicles, with cobalt being the limiting factor. With recycling accounted for, this number jumps to 197 million cars. In this scenario, lithium becomes the restricting element. The paper does make some strange comparisons, though. One of these, in particular, grabbed the headlines. T and E chose to compare the volume of petrol that a car needs in its lifetime to the volume of metal in an electric car's battery pack. This is the sort of novelty factoid that you'd find in a geeky Christmas cracker, rather than any serious and useful number, because it's not a meaningful comparison. The more important comparison, though, is lifetime energy usage. The group found that BEVs will use 58% less energy over the lifespan of the car compared to their gasoline counterparts. And this includes everything from the energy production to the car manufacturing process. On lifetime carbon emissions, the study concluded that battery electric vehicles are three times more efficient, a number that will only improve over time as the electrical grid shifts away from fossil fuels. EVs were shown to be far more efficient in every single European country too, even Poland, which has the dirtiest grid mix in the EU. T&E also considered capital investment in grid planning, finding that investing in EVs and renewable energy would produce six to seven times more useful energy at the wheels. With a full transition to EVs and green energy, 40% of global oil demand would completely disappear. Electric vehicles have been improving a lot in recent years. Between 2010 and 2020, battery prices plummeted by 89% to $137 per kilowatt hour. At the cell level, the price has fallen below $100 per kilowatt hour. This trend will continue to lower the cost of EVs over time. And as with other studies, T&E found that the lifetime cost of battery electric vehicles is lower than gasoline vehicles. 7,000 euro less, in fact. But while the falling cost of batteries will help to lower the price of EVs long term, a cheaper total cost of ownership won't drive down prices. In fact, it might actually drive them up, as manufacturers, knowing that they won't make as much on parts and service, try and shift some of that profit making into the purchase cost. So a higher upfront cost remains a barrier to entry for many who can't make higher upfront payments, even if an EV would be cheaper in the long run. So goes the Captain Samuel Vim's boots theory of economic unfairness. T&E emphasizes Europe's current dependency on oil, stating that around 50% of the quote, energy available for final consumption, end quote, comes from oil and petroleum products. Of that 50%, two-thirds goes to the transportation sector. And of that two-thirds, 73%, it's just for road transportation. The transportation sector's heavy reliance on fossil fuels adds EU concerns regarding oil dependence since oil is largely imported. 
Before Brexit, the UK produced 70% of the total oil production in the European Union. Following the UK's exit from the EU, 96% of EU oil is imported. So before we go and look at the recommendations, we should remember this is a European group looking at European policy. Having said that, the policy suggestions I think would probably work pretty much anywhere. So we should think of these ideas as things that should be studied and followed globally. They are, first, accelerate the shift to fully electric vehicles while promoting public transport options. Second, set stronger targets for battery recycling and work to develop lower carbon batteries. Third, set policy that will cement Europe as a self-sufficient supplier of batteries. And finally, remove subsidies from the fossil fuel industry and halt damaging practices within that industry. The TNE report makes strong arguments about how the shift to electric vehicles should be approached on a global scale. Enacting similar targets and regulations worldwide would be a substantial step on the road to global climate reform. But as we have addressed before, policy changes require a lot of work from those seeking to push them through, which normally requires many years of lobbying, grassroots support, and much more. But that, of course, is for another video. If you want to check out the report for yourself, we've linked to it in the show notes, and unlike some reports we've covered, it is completely free to read. So give it a go and let us know in the comments below what you think. That's it for today. As always, thanks to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month Patreons, Ray Jean Fellows, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sandborn, Anthony Coates, Sean Ueda, and Tesla in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 dollar a month Patreon supporters. They are John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian. You can join all of these amazing Patreon supporters by following the links below, and you'll also find a link that you can use to send us a tip through Ko-fi or Bitcoin if you'd prefer to support us that way. You'll also find a link to our Discord chat server, which is completely free to join. So please give that a go if you're feeling chatty. And as usual, you'll find everything from t-shirts to face masks, water bottles to hoodies at our Redbubble store. Thanks for joining me. And as always, keep evolving. <laughs> <laughs>